I'm going to invite our other presenters here to the front. I do know we are running a little bit behind schedule, but I do want to give you an opportunity for about five minutes to ask um, our panelists questions. So in the interest of time, I will just go ahead and open it up to the audience. Do you have any questions for our group? And if you don't, of course, I do. Well, to go ahead and get us started, um, one thing I did want to point out that became obvious to me as you're all running through your presentations that might be similar across um, each of the presentations is the idea of food insecurity and then from a policy standpoint, focusing on the state policy about reducing sales tax if sales tax were on food were reduced or eliminated in Kansas, what impact would it have essentially from the top down? So in schools, what impact do we think it might have on school funding or school um, budgets? What impact would it have on obviously the individuals that you just heard Emily talking about where um, budget dollars are stretched? Is there any, are there any estimates for that or has anyone talked about that? It, if you're looking for specific dollar amounts, I, I can't give you any of those projections. What I can say is the average combined sales tax on food is about 10% right now. Um, the state's, state's part of that is six and a half. So if the state brought its sales tax down to say the same level as Missouri, you'd see a 5% um, decrease in the cost of, of food, um, which effectively, at least in theory, means 5% more in the spending budget for actual food at schools. And um, I'm sure Rachel could tell you, but you probably all have heard, schools kind of need that money right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so do people who are struggling with food insecurity in their homes. Anything else to add to that? So a pretty uh, uh, opportunity for a broad reach. So when we think about that big um, policy impact. Robin, do you have a question? Yeah, great presentations, everyone. Uh, Emily, I, this question is for you. I was struck by your last slide where you mentioned that uh, patients were asking for information um, at multiple locations where they currently go. So why can't they get information about um, uh, healthy foods and, and affordable foods at schools and at their hospitals? And I, I thought that that really struck me. Do you have any more to say about that uh, from what the patients were telling you or, or whether there's any examples of, of that actually happening right now? Yeah, um, so you know, I think one of the things in the context of those conversations, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make my interpretation of the context of those conversations and say part of that was also about trust. So they talked about places in the community, um, throughout the community where they'd wanna receive information or where they'd wanna um, participate in programs. And so um, schools being one of those and then the, and Children's Mercy being one of those. I mean, obviously we had people come to the focus groups who probably have a, re a trusted relationship with Children's Mercy, that's just you know, you probably wouldn't come if you didn't. Um, but I think that was part of that underlying conversation was, and also I think that convenience and ease of somewhere that's nearby me. Um, and so I think that's, um, that's part of what we're hearing sort of across whatever idea it might be is, you know, meeting people where they're at and using those trusted entities to deliver programs and information. Go ahead. Um, yeah, hi. So my question is for Rachel. Um, one of the things that you talked on was uh, the interest from the younger children uh, working in the farm, and I was curious if there's any current or future intention to reach out to early childhood. Yes, there is. We have, with Case Healthy Kids, we've just received a Kellogg grant that is focusing on that population. And then very briefly, I talked about National Farm to School Network. We're the core partner for the state of Kansas. And the two components of that, one is policy and the other is early childhood education. So there are national agencies working to funnel more resources to that age group and then to help within that system as well. Because it's just a bit different than K through 12. So they want to tailor it to make it more user friendly and not lump you guys in with the K through 12 stuff. That's exciting information. Next. Hi, my question is for Beth. On the sales tax or the, yeah, the food sales tax effort, is there an idea to tax certain foods, uh, perhaps a little more than others, say veggies come down and candy goes up or stays the same? Um, 
there have been proposals that tax different types of food transactions differently or different types of food differently. So um, some of those proposals have treated dining outside of the home um, at restaurants or so forth. Um, those, that experience would be taxed versus grocery or retail food sales might be taxed uh, at a lower rate. Others have proposed changing, um, differentiating between healthy versus non uh, unhealthy foods. The problem with doing either of those things is that in Kansas they have something called the streamlined sales tax. And so um, a reduction in the sales tax on um, a sort of a category of items has to be consistent. Um, I'm oversimplifying things a little bit to keep this short because I know we're short <laughs> on time. But uh, the policy environment more, much more broadly makes that a very complicated task. Hello. Um, I'm trying to think back to uh, David Renz's uh, presentation at the beginning of the day, and I forget the the categories that he had up there. Um, but he kind of split the socio -e ecological model into the three parts of system changes: um, policy component of it, the physical and social environment, and then the transmission of the behaviors, right, across cultures and all of that. This is a broad question, I'm sorry. So it's, it's for all of you. If you're looking at people eating healthier, individuals and families eating healthier here in Kansas City, I'm, I work in Wyandotte County, I guess where do we need the most work? Because I, I, I was thinking about that in your, because we were working on the policy level. It strikes me that the work with the kids at Emmy Pearson and the working working to get the kids in the farm and handling the vegetables and stuff is very much targeting the, that bottom level, which is the transmission of behaviors. It's a really neat way to get kids. Maybe they garden at home, maybe they don't, but it's a, it's a neat way to kind of work on that bottom level. Where would you say we need more programs and interventions as a region uh, in those levels? I know that's a tough question, but, and it's for everyone. <laughs> um, hmm. I, I, I'm not necessarily sure that I would say that we ne need more. I think sometimes, as we've been seeing, like more incentive programs actually seems to be, in our evaluation efforts, actually seems to be confusing people more. So like on the Kansas side, we have the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program, which is awesome, but it would sure be nice if it were, if it were more easy to understand and like seniors really, because I actually get most of the, a lot of phone calls for that program and it's not my program. So, but they don't understand, it's like very confusing to have like in Columbia Farmers Market, six different incentive programs all of them slightly different, all of them working a little bit different. So if there's some way we could streamline or mm, figure out to, how to make it a little more simple. Um, also like in the grocery stores, if there, were one, if there was one way we could do this, instead of having to figure out every gosh darn IT system and struggle through those barriers, those problems, it would be way, I mean it's just almost simplification rather than let's add more. Let's find one or two different models that really work and use those. Is there any push to do that? Have, have you heard of any push to do that at all? Um, I'm, act, I'm pushing to do that. I, uh, <laughs> uh, there's a, the, one of our partners is Fair Food Network who, out of Michigan who has a lobbyist who works a lot with the, with the grocers associations and so I've been like, bring this up, let them figure this out. I'm not a grocery store expert. So let the grocers figure out if they're gonna get a lot of money from the food bill, from the farm bill, they better make this work and make sure it works so that those big numbers can largely be going for fruits and vegetables. What this makes me think about is um, understanding what's working, so evaluation of current programs to know which ones are working and why. So Emily gave a great example. We think about food prescriptions. People talk about it broadly. It sounds like a great concept, but what we found with our population was it wasn't being redeemed. So what is it about that that is preventing redemption of what we think is a really great you know, 
um, opportunity. So number one is understanding, really understanding what works. Um, and then two is communication. And I think you've heard that theme consistently with the presentations, not just with this group, but also in other sessions. Getting the word out is extremely difficult. How do we do it? How do we do this better? And how do we do this together? So before we thank our speakers for taking the time out of their day and presenting, I'd like to encourage each of you to think about that. What do you want to do differently when you go back to your own organizations, um, programs, projects? How do we find partners? Um, how do we do a better job of sharing this information, promoting what works, and, and understanding better what works so that we have a chance at population level reductions of obesity? So with that, um, I'm going to wrap up the session. Please join me in thanking our speakers.